prior to the New Testament, God was essentially worshipped in a temple mostly by his children, predominantly by his children, the Israelites, the Jewish nation, the chosen children of God. God had chosen leaders out of that nation, and we read about those leaders all throughout the Old Testament, and the calling upon their lives was to reveal to the Jewish nation, centered mainly in Jerusalem, that sin separates us from God. And that one day, God would send a rescuer, a savior, into the world through their lineage, through the Jewish lineage, and this Savior would come not only to rescue them, these Jewish men and women from their sins, but Gentiles as well. That's good news. Some 2,000 years ago, God's word, scripture, God's truth tells us that Jesus Christ, God's very son, was born as a baby in Bethlehem, and he lived in that vicinity, the Jerusalem vicinity, and this Jesus, this Messiah, represented, he embodied the very characteristics and the very nature of God the Father. Because he was God, Jesus also kept God's law perfectly so that he could then become an unflawed sacrifice on the cross, paying in full as our substitute, the payment that was due for our sin. God's word also tells us that after Jesus died, he was buried. And he was buried in a grave. Because you see, the payment for sin is death. But Jesus, this Son of God, overpowered not just sin, but death as well. And so God the Father raised him from the grave, and Jesus, the Son of God, now sits at the Father's right hand, waiting to receive anyone who would put their faith in him for the forgiveness of sin. Essentially, that's the gospel message that has its roots in the Old Testament. This book of Acts, as you know, is written by Dr. Luke, who also wrote the gospel of Luke. And Acts, this letter that we have been studying, essentially gives us a glimpse into how the church was born and how it started there in the vicinity of Jerusalem, the hub of the Jewish culture. But the question that must be answered is this. How would this gospel message about Jesus ever move beyond the walls of Jerusalem? How would this gospel message ever move out beyond this predominantly 
Jewish nation and out into the rest of the world that was now primarily made up of Gentiles. We know that was the plan. The gospel was never just meant for the Jews. Before Jesus ascended back to heaven, he said to his disciples, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. And then right here at the beginning of our letter in Acts, again, Jesus says to the apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right where they're at, and then in Judea, and then in Samaria, and to the ends of the world. But the question remains, how will this good news, how will this gospel ever move beyond the confines of basically a Jewish Jerusalem? If I was going to start a movement and I said, hey, we've got a really good thing, a powerful thing going on here, but we need to get it out beyond Lakeville and we need to kind of move it into Taunton and then maybe up to Bridgewater and, and then to Boston and, and then maybe up to Vermont and, and then out to to Colorado, and then maybe to California, and then maybe to China. If I were going to take something great like the movement of the church and reveal its saving, rescuing, good news message, if I were to take that out into the world, I'd certainly, I'd certainly want to do it in a positive, affirming, optimistic way. Otherwise, you'd never follow, nor would I, because that's how our natures are built. I want to make the gospel message as attractive as I could, and I'd be very tempted to hire a good marketing agency and, and put a shiny spin on it. And, and, and get this gospel message to be pumped up in your hearts and in your minds. And then I'd want to launch it out with an upbeat affirmation. But that's not how Jesus works. <laughs> and that's not how Jesus got the good news that, you, that the church proclaimed out of Jewish Jerusalem. If you remember the last time we were here in this book, Stephen, the man that was chosen to be a deacon in that first church, this godly man, this true leader, this authentic follower of Jesus, we, we read about him in, in, in chapter 7. He, you'll remember he gives this moving sermon to those Jewish leaders in that Jewish Jerusalem about their heritage and, and how, it, how at just the right time, you know, God was going to send them a Messiah, a rescuer. And this Savior would come to, to rescue them, to save them out of their imprisoned lives. You see, he brought that message to them because these leaders, these Jewish leaders, believed that you had to work hard and you had to be religious to get to God. And certainly they believed a relationship with God could never just come by simply putting your faith or your trust in what Jesus Christ had done on the cross. That would be too simple. That would be too easy. That would take out of me the, the effort, the, the human drive, the, 
the, the fleshly drive that I have deep inside. And so these men, as Craig just read, upon hearing about faith alone for salvation, they get so upset. They get so upset with Stephen and his message about this Jesus that they have him stoned to death. You remember when we looked at that latter part of chapter 7 last time, you remember it said in verse 54 that when they, these Jewish leaders, heard these things spoken by Stephen, they were enraged and, and, and they ground their teeth at him. And then in verse 58 of that seventh chapter, it says they cast him out of the city and they stoned him and the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now this Saul that's spoken of here, he's a a Jewish leader, a Jewish leader that was called a Pharisee. And essentially, the Pharisees believed that you should not only uh, follow the ways of Scripture that has been breathed out by God himself, but that you should also follow after the traditions and the customs that were religious in nature, but not necessarily from God himself. So over the years and the years and the years of, you know, this Jewish culture, traditions rose up. Ideas about what it meant to be spiritual and religious rose up. And those beliefs that were man-made, if you will, kind of equaled the truth that God had given, and they were kind of like on common ground in the Pharisees' mind. And so you followed the words of God, but you also followed the traditions of man. And essentially, Saul, along with the other Pharisees, believed that you got to God, you had a relationship with God by essentially behavior change and not by heart change. Good, morally upright, religious people were accepted by God. That was their belief. And so the Pharisees looked to keeping the laws of God in Scripture simply for the sake of keeping them out of duty rather than keeping them because their heart had changed and now they longed to love God by obeying God. Now, this is very, very important for us to understand because many of us can slightly fall into that same category, sometimes not even knowing it. Coming to the realization that at the core of the gospel message, it's about a relationship with Jesus. It's not about a religion. When we try to live by all the do's and don'ts, the laws of Scripture, and we tr when we try to gain approval, God's approval, by our deeds, we can then also become very rigid, very fixated, very pharisaical, if you will, and our zeal for God now becomes duty-based, and that's exactly how we find Saul here. Saul is a good religious Pharisee. He's a good religious man, and he's passionate about religion, and he's passionate about God, and he's passionate about the laws of God, but understand that this passion isn't based on God's truth. It's based on 
oral tradition that essentially says, do good, be good, work hard, keep the law, be a good person, and then God will accept you. If you look at verse 1 of chapter 8, it says that Saul, in his religious fervor, approved of Stephen's execution. But then notice what it says. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, against the followers of Jesus now in Jerusalem. And they, meaning this newly formed church, were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except for the apostles. And devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul, this religious man, this Pharisee was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And so there's a, a handful of things that we want to notice here about Saul's religious religious passion. First, here's the first principle. Saying I love all of God, but not loving all of his word is an impossibility. Did you hear that? Saying that I love all of God, but not loving all of his word is an impossibility. In other words, a true love of God will always lead me to a true love of all of God's word. And I think this is what we see missing here initially with Saul. Saul loves God. He loves his laws. But his passion and his acceptance uh, by God has outrun his knowledge and his understanding of God, which comes through God's word to us. And so Saul's got ahead of himself. He's got ahead of God here. Now, the Pharisees knew, just as an example, the Pharisees knew the Old Testament like the back of their hand. And so Saul would have known a proverb out of the Old Testament. And one of the proverbs he would have known was Proverbs 14.25 that says this, A truthful witness saves lives, but one who breathes out lies is deceitful. Saul would have known that. But what does Saul do? He, he, he not only approves of someone being killed, but he goes on trying to get other followers of Jesus killed. You see, all of God's truth, all of God's truth is the standard for all of our living. And when I turn my back on the portions of his truth that I don't like, I'm not comfortable with, that doesn't kind of sit well with me, then what I'm doing now is I'm living in deceit. I've got one foot in the truth of God's word, and I've got one foot in the deceit of my fleshly thinking. It's what James calls in his book a double-minded man. Speaking of God, King David said in Psalm 51, 6, Behold, you delight in truth. You delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. So God gives us his truth, not just for outward behavior, but to actually change my heart, which means he's about changing me as a whole person. And that's why we talk around here about our vision being wholeheartedly after Jesus. You see, Saul passionately pursued God, but it was on his own terms. And it wasn't based on the truths that had been revealed in Scripture. 
The second principle that we see here is this. Religious passion doesn't make me a child of God. It says in verse 3 of that eighth chapter in Acts that Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And so again, you need to understand that Saul here is zealous. He's 100% in to doing what he believes will please God in the end. He isn't just happy to have Stephen's life snuffed out. Now he's after every follower of Jesus. And he's convinced that what he's saying and, and, and what he's doing and the affections that he's pursuing are all God-honoring. That's why he does it with such great zeal. He wants God's favor. But understand this, a skewed passion for God can easily result in displeasing God rather than pleasing God. You see, Saul has no doubt just heard the message that Stephen has given about how God has chosen us to be his children. And he's no doubt heard how, in that message by Stephen, how God has led the Jews over and over to experience God's love, his his unconditional love, and how that love will one day be personified in Jesus. He, he, he's no doubt just heard this very powerful message from Stephen's own lips that God's Spirit longs to draw us to Jesus Christ who's done for us what we can't do for ourselves. And how at the cross, Jesus secured forgiveness, and how being good is never good enough. Like that's ringing in Saul's ears. Saul knows the message, but he's missed the real messenger, and that being God himself. So he keeps trying. He keeps working. He keeps going after getting God's attention by being religiously upright, religiously good. You see, as you and I know, that was never why the law of God was given, so that we could work at trying to achieve it, so that we could work our way into getting right with God. The law of God, all the do's, all the don'ts that we see over and over in Scripture are simply meant to drive us to Jesus and to his grace. In fact, it says in Galatians chapter 2, we know, we know that a person is not justified, is not made Right by works of the law. But how? Through faith in Jesus Christ, because by works of the law, no one will ever be justified. So, again, sometimes you can be very in love with God but not necessarily in love with all of his truth. And you can be religiously passionate, but not really following the God of the Bible. Because God doesn't accept us because of what we do. He accepts us because of what Jesus has done. When we put our trust and our faith in that reality. Our hearts, our spiritual hearts are changed. They're transformed. And now the Holy Spirit takes up 
residence in us. And that's how we become the church. The church isn't a building. You are the church if Christ resides in you. These are just four walls. And that's why people all over this world this morning are worshiping in all kinds of different spaces and places and buildings, not because the Spirit resides in that building, but rather because they, the Spirit resides in them and they've come together to be the church. And so, obedience to all of the truth that God puts before us, it's never achieved perfectly. But it's something that our hearts strive after because we're in love with Jesus for what Jesus has done for us. It's very, very important to understand this. And as I was studying this week, Matthew 7 Verse 22 and following kept coming back to my mind where Jesus says, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord. In other words, Master, (laughs) Master, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? But then Jesus will declare, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of what? Lawlessness. Lawlessness. You see, we can think we're doing right, but in reality, we are lawless. And so moral righteousness does not get us to heaven. And religious passion doesn't make us a child of God. Only faith in Christ Jesus and what he's done for us. Here's our third principle. God's plan and purposes are never thwarted by misaligned religious passions. God's plan, God's purposes are never thwarted by misaligned religious passions. Now, I want you to notice something here in Acts 8, which is going to really mark now a major transition in this letter. Notice in the midst of all this crooked passion, in the midst of all of this misaligned passion, especially on behalf of Saul, notice how God still uses all of that for his good and his glory. Note what it says in verse 4 of this 8th chapter. Now, those who were scattered... What did they do? They went about preaching the word of God. Did you hear that? They left Jerusalem like a bunch of anxious chickens, but that's okay. That's for another sermon. They left not with the Pharisaical kind of teaching that Saul brought in, now they're going out with the truth of God's word, because it says they're now going out preaching the word. You see, in chapter 1, excuse me, verse 1 of this chapter, we're told that the followers of Jesus were, were scattered because of the persecution of the church. And now verse 4 tells us that these followers of Jesus are scattered. And they're not just running away in fear, but they are running away from Jerusalem with the truth of the gospel. And it's this running away that takes the good news about Jesus, not only, uh, I think it's north to to Judea, and not only there on to Samaria... And not only then on to the Roman world, but also this running away, hear me, with God's truth, has actually moved beyond the confines of the uh, the walls of Jerusalem, and it's moved beyond the walls of that continent, 
to even be here with us this morning because what you have in your hands is the truth of God's word that at one day was predominantly right there in Jerusalem, mainly for the Jewish people. But it's come to us who are Gentiles. And that's why we're here this morning. You see, God's word is living. It doesn't stop at one point. It keeps moving out. It's got this ripple effect. And as we give our lives to the truth, as we give our lives over to Jesus, as we love Jesus for who Jesus is and what Jesus alone has done for us, our lives are transformed and those in our midst, their lives can be transformed because they see something different about us. It's the persecution of this early church that God uses to bring about spiritual power. And it was misaligned passion that God used to unleash his salvation message to even those of us here some 2,000 years removed. We'll talk more next week about the spreading of the gospel, but let me just end this morning with an application for you. God is not pursuing you this morning so that you can simply become a moral machine in his hands that simply does what is right and avoids what is wrong. Did you hear that? God's not in the business of pursuing you this morning so that you can simply become a moral machine that simply does what is right and avoids what is wrong. That's not God's plan for your life. God's desire in pursuing you is so that you can know him so that you can receive him and so that you can love him back by pursuing and obeying Jesus for who Jesus is. When your heart and my heart is aligned with him and he becomes now the foundation of our lives, it's then that we begin to passionately pursue a life that is purposeful, a life that is pleasing, not just for us, but also for God's glory. So I don't know where you're at in your passion journey. I don't know if you're passionately pursuing God throughout the week, or if you're just passionately pursuing him on Sunday. And I don't know if the, the, the end of the means is so that you'll get him to like you. I'm not sure if that's where your passion is. But I just want you to know this morning that you're going to get out of breath really quick. I've been there, and I've hit that wall. I know what it's like to try to pursue goodness, righteousness, perfection, so that somehow, in some way, God will just accept me. That's a lie from Satan himself. Jesus loves you because he loves you. And Jesus loves you because he loves you because that's his nature. And Jesus wants you, not so that you can perform all the do's and not perform all the don'ts. Jesus wants you so that you can experience the life that you and I were created to experience. John Piper says this, whatever you do, find the God-centered, Christ-exalting, 
Bible or truth saturated passion of your life and find your way to say it and live for it and die for it and you will make a difference that lasts and you will not waste your life. Let's pray. God, help us to learn from the life of Saul that it's not about being morally upright, but rather it's all about being wholeheartedly surrendered to you, Lord Jesus. Because there at the foot of the cross, we find unconditional love, forgiveness for all our sin, and purpose for life. Change us through the truth of your word, by the power of your spirit, And this we pray in Jesus' name.